Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the invitation from QED uh, to uh, present at this, um, at this forum again. Uh, I think the most important thing to remember in the context of money market funds and what's being debated in European Parliament at this point is that a standard set of rules for operation um, in Europe as well as across the, the world is, is actually very important. Without this, um, there is danger of owning a security or an investment outside of money market fund risk bounds. And so what you end up with is investors who think they own one thing, and in fact, it could be something different because it's the Euro version of that, or it's the US version of that, or it's the Asian version of that. Rather, I think the, um, you know, the definition from a money market fund perspective needs to be global in nature. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely identical, but the risk mitigating factors are ones that um, need to be very standard. Uh, the definition and the, the set of rules that govern how these funds are invested is how the mitigation of risk in these products takes place. There's interest rate risk, there's liquidity risk, there's credit risk. Um, the rules around those types of, um, of investments within the funds themselves are what help to mitigate it and make it a very high quality, low volatility short term investment. Um, also, the ability to disclose, promote um, similar disclosures um, and have uh, an appropriate amount of, of diversification are extremely important when you're looking at investing these types of products in all markets. The best solution when you talk about um, the, the risk mitigation of runs, and it's interesting to note that in Europe, um, CNAV and VNAV have existed alongside each other for quite a long time, really since the market began back in the, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, the market is about evenly divided, half and half, and when you look at the experience of both VNAV and CNAV products during the 2008 financial crisis, in Europe they were pretty much identical from a redemption perspective, and it was very much contained uh, within a manageable amount. What this, is, the, the, this debate grows from is problems that existed in the United States um, where we had a certain type of institutional prime investor that actually um, caused a lot more of the run risk to be noted in various types of products. And over a short week's time, the week that Lehman defaulted and the week that the primary reserve fund broke a dollar in the United States, we ended up from September 15th to September 19th of that particular week with the, that type of fund actually experiencing about a little over a 20% amount of withdrawal. Now contrast that to other types of funds in the US, government funds actually took money in, retail funds actually were very stable, maybe two or 3%, much like um, the, the, the European market from a redemption perspective, but quite manageable. So it is interesting that this is really debating from a very single singular type of event that happened one time in the United States with a set of circumstances around which um, hopefully in our lifetime never come, come to fruition again. Um, but, but essentially, when you talk about what stops that, how, do, how does it end, how do you quickly um, keep a run from promulgating itself, it's, it's gates and fees. Gates and fees are something that have been proposed um, and are very much in the uh, I think popular sector of the rule changes um, and effectively when you look at them from an oversight perspective with discretion from somebody interested in the product like the board of directors, we think you end up with a um, risk mitigation per, uh, process from a run standpoint that really causes those funds to, uh, to, 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 to continue to uh, perform in the way that they have, where essentially the redemption profile looks the same, whether you're talking about VNAV, CNAV, um, European, US. Um, looking at Europe in particular, when you look at, um, again, the, the VNAV and CNAV side, as we, as we mentioned, uh, there was a lot of debate over some of the statistics that were reported. But in the end, I think what was brought forth was that there was um, a very similar redemption pattern to both types of products. One didn't stand out to be particularly more volatile than another. 
So if we look at some of the exemptions that have been placed on the table for um, taking the industry more in Europe towards the VNAV side of the equation, government funds. Government funds are one of those that have been proposed. And government funds are a very large par portion of the US market. They make up about half of the market. In Europe, they make up about 10%. So this is what you can invest in. Going back to what Jennifer was saying, this is one of the exemptions based on what can be invested in. And when we look at just the inclusion of European sovereigns, although there are 28 at this point, many of them from a credit risk uh, mitigation perspective do not have the credit profiles that are necessary for a low risk, low volatility program um, and product like a money market fund. So um, inclusion in this context of the US or other G20 type of countries would be needed in order to um, supply the amount of quality issuers that would be necessary from a sovereign perspective or from a semi-sovereign or sovereign supported perspective in order to just get to the appropriate amount of diversification and credit risk. Much of the industry in Europe is rated AAA and those AAA ratings are also something that dictate what in fact, in fact, can be used within the various portfolios. Um, and again, there are very, uh, it's a much more narrow list of sovereigns that could be used. So when you include um, just the, the European sovereigns, although you think, see the number of 28 and you think that seems like a, a good and diverse number, in fact, once it's narrowed down by your own credit risk requirements as well as those of the rating agencies, it gets down to a much, much smaller number. If you look at the exemptions in the US, which include government money market funds, um, and then they include the retail investor, the expectations are that when the rule is implemented on October 14th of 2016 in the United States, 80% of the market will remain stable net asset value, or CNAV. Um, so it's a good portion that is exempted from the changes that have occurred in the US. When we look at that in the same context, and go back to what Jennifer was saying, the definitions in Europe are different than they are in, in the US, you get something that's probably about 20%. So it's a very different end result. I think probably what makes it even more difficult going forward is the fact that the um, ECB quantitative easing will be purchasing much of the, the debt that could be used within these types of products, short term, highest quality, out of the marketplace as part of their QE process over the course of the next two years. And so what is already a very small pool I think gets even smaller. And, and believe me, we're all in favor of the QE side of the equation, so certainly don't want to dissuade any of that, but I think it just takes what is already a limited pool from an exemption perspective and make it even more limited. When we look at um, the inclusion of the, the, the US government as, as, as one of the options for that um, exclusion or for that exemption, I know many have asked why would you want to fund the United States debt from a European perspective and why are there dollars being funded through the euro market anyways? And I think probably the easiest answer um, is, is twofold. Number one, you've got a lot of things that trade in US dollars. Oil is probably the largest, but lots of other commodities. And so there's a cash uh, hoard of dollars that from all corporations' perspective, uh, for the most part, remains on their balance sheet and they need to invest in dollars. otherwise they're taking some sort of currency risk. Um, the second side is, is, is a result of multinational corporations that operate in Europe, but in fact have a need for funding from various currencies, includes euros, includes sterling, includes US dollars, includes yen in many instances. So those two reasons are, it's not a nationalistic sort of, um, of support mechanism from a US government perspective. It's simply where the market exists today and that exists um, from a US dollar perspective for half of the euro denominated funds in the, in the, in the uh, operation today. When we look at what might happen if, um, CNAV became entirely required to move to VNAV in Europe. Basically, the investors that we have within our constant net asset value products here in, in Europe um, are local authorities, they're charities, they are pension funds, they are insurers, um, they are trust departments, and 
corpse and effectively what we've been told by probably 80% of them is CNAV is what makes their investment usable for them. It's not the return. The return has been minuscule and certainly if you're invested in it from a euro denominated perspective at this point it's less than minuscule, uh, disappearing fast. Um, and the uh, ease of use on a constant net asset value product, a stable net asset value product, and their ability to know from a corporate treasurer perspective or from a local, pers local authority perspective that when they put in one unit of currency, they have the ability to remove that one unit of currency. That goes away in a variable net asset value product. Also, their capability of intraday trading becomes problematic. Um, and I know many from a VNAV perspective talk about same day liquidity, but the question is number one, how do they price? And number two, is same day liquidity end of day, three or four p.m. in the afternoon versus intraday happening at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12, 1. Um, because from what we understand and can, can decipher, without amortized cost uh, pricing, that becomes an impossibility. Now let's talk for a second about amortized cost pricing because Nina did bring it up and she talked about it as something that was not a real value. And that's just something that is, um, as you understand it a little bit more, uh, not, not, a, not a statement that can be supported. The reason that it can't be supported is because of the very short term, high quality nature of it. And these are, for the most part, hold, it, hold uh, to maturity types of instruments. When you bring into the um, equation a pricing vendor that looks at these securities on a daily basis and tries to come up with a value for them, um, end of day value, not a price, not an intraday value. You end up with something that starts with amortized cost at pricing and may have minor adjustments. The fact of the matter is, amortized cost is unless there is a credit event, the 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 best. Um, value or the best estimation of value that exists in the market today.